All right, welcome back. Now, a 2017 report commissioned by the National Council on the Administration of Justice revealed more than 75% of prisoners are aged between 18 and 35, with about 70% of them being petty offenders. Young people who find themselves on the wrong side of the law oftentimes come from broken families and low-income homes, increasing their chances of finding themselves in a jail cell more often. But a a lot more contributes to this problem, and that's what we are discussing tonight. Let me quickly introduce my panel to my far right, uh, Nameless, the man without a name, David Madenge, also a Kenyan musician joining us. He also leads a mentorship program, which we'll be talking about a bit later on. Next to him is Jane Kuria. She is a CEO of Faraja Foundation that has been working with offenders and ex-offenders since 1999. Uh, we also have Mary Kaemba, who is the director of offender correction and re rehabilitation in the Kenya prisons. And in my extended panel, I have Joseph Mwangi to my closest left, a counseling psychologist, as well as a lecturer at JQuat, and Peter Ooko, who is a paralegal expert and ex-offender. And of course, we also have uh, four ex-offenders joining us, uh, Nick James, Carissa Charo, John Njoroge, and Basil Kungu. Thank you so much for joining us. And my other extended panel students from uh, St. Paul's University, UON, and of course, uh, KUT. Thank you so much for joining us. MKU, I beg your pardon. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, but let me begin with you, Mary, just to get a sense of what our prison system looks like now. I just read a statistic of how much of that population is young people. Um, break it down for us in terms of the average profile of a young person behind bars right now. Okay, when we look at the prison population as per now, uh, I, would, uh, I would say that uh, the population of young people uh, is actually a half of the population. Mm -hmm. That is 35 and below. That is the population of the young people. And young people, we look at 35 up to around 19, then we have those ones who are below 18 years. So actually a half of them are actually the youth that we are holding in our institutions. Right. And it's a very sad affair. And uh, No, absolutely. And what mm. kind of crimes would you say they are actually being put in for? Most of them commit the crimes adults commit. Mm -hmm. Like the, 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 the young people mostly, they commit crimes for survival. Right. That is stealing, stealing by servant, house breaking, um, stealing stock, stealing whatever they can get so that they survive. And then they also commit uh, drug and substance abuse drug uh, offenses. These are linked to either they are peddlers or they are used by people to peddle drugs or they, they are in possession of the, the substance drugs. Then we have uh, sexual offenses crimes. We have gang rape. We have devilers, we have incest, we have all these type of uh, uh, drugs. And the young ones also, they arrest for gambling. Gambling in public places. So you find that they are also arrested. They are also arrested for uh, planning to omit felony. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, the whatever. And they are also committed for bigger crimes, robbery with violence. But you know them, the robbery is mostly attached to the adults. So you find that they commit those crimes, they also commit murder, they commit, um, uh, they are charged for manslaughter, they are charged for all these actually crimes that, that most of the adults uh, commit. Yeah. And right now, as you realize, we have the violent extremists where we are having mm. children, uh, people getting into the issue of uh, being uh, lured into these violent extremist uh, offenses. They, they get into it, they are both because of just survival. So largely most of the young people commit crimes for survival. So they engage in those type of crimes. And I'd like to actually hear from someone who's lived this. You know, they have been through a life of crime, been behind bars. I think let's hear from uh, Carissa Charo just to tell us about his experience. And I know, uh, Carissa, you're more comfortable in SWA, so it's okay. But tell us what got you in, in jail. Ongeatu. Komajina Dixon. Endelea, endelea. 
kwa majina anaitwa Dickson Karisa Charo natoka Mombasa mm. sehemu ya Malindi And why were you arrested? Mbona ilishikwa? Nakumbuka tarehe Nilishikiwa na kesi ya ya mada na ni story ndefu ambayo haikuwa na nihusu lakini ikanilazimu inihusu na kisa ilikuwa ni ni msichana na msichana hakuwa wangu alikuwa wa brother yangu mm-hmm. na wakati waka wa, chanzo chanzo kabisa alikuwa ni huyo msichana na hiyo hiyo vita ilikuwa ya matanga sasa mtu yule jamaa mwenye alikuwa na ule msichana msichana hakuwa amemwambia brother yangu kwamba wakutane pale matangani ju brother yangu alikuwa amemwambia mimi sitaenda na msichana akamwambia brother yangu hata mimi basi kama we hutaenda hata mimi sitaenda ilikuwa 209 hmm. na kutoka hapo msichana akaenda alienda na kimbele kule kwa matanga na brother yangu akakuja na nyuma na watu walikuwa wameagana wasiende sasa ule msichana alienda aka, aka alikuwa ameagana chali mwingine wakutane hapo sasa kukutana hapo wakaitisha vinywaji vyao pale yule brother yangu aka a, alikuwa na friend yake akamwambia basi kuja nikuonyeshe yule demo mwenye unataka kumuoa kuja nikuonyeshe mahali yako alipochukuliwa akaenda mpaka pale akaambia basi si yule akasema ah ni yule yule msichana kumuona akatoka pale kwa yule kwa ule yule jamaa akakuja kwa huyu brother yangu yule jamaa akatoka pale akakuja pa, akakuja mahali kwenye yako ile brother yangu haya akamwambia yule msichana basi kama umeona boyfriend yako nipe ile pesa nye nimeharibu pa nimeharibu pale demo akasema mimi sina pesa yule jamaa akamwambia huyu brother yangu wewe nilipe 1500 Brother yangu akamwambia basi kama ni msichana we chukua lakini ukupatia pesa. Mimi sioni kikupatia. Kuongea hivyo tayari sasa ikaanza kuwa vita. Sasa mtawa wa ule wa yule jamaa na mtawa wa huyu brother yangu ikawa ni mtaa na mtaa ikaanza kupiga ikaanza kupigana. Haya wali hiyo vita iliendelea kutoka kutoka saa hii ni usiku kaisha saa nane. ule msichana bahati mbaya alipatwa rungu ya tumbo alipopatwa tu, ile rungu ya tumbo alimwagika damu na ndani ikarungulia kwa tumbo akaenda usi kaenda na brother yangu haya akashuhulikiwa na asubuhi karudi tena huko Masai lipo ilipoyoyoma msichana akakufa. Basi kutoka hiyo 209 tulishikwa watu wangapi watu waine. Mm. Lakini kwa bahati mbaya ama mzuri tulifanya kesi mpaka ikakuja ikaisha ikaisha 2014. Wakati wakati wangu wa wa age Sikuwa nimefikisha 18. Mm-hmm. Sasa hukumu kuni hukumu. Jaji alipo ni hukumu, akani hukumu hukumu ya, ya utoto. Ulikuwa uh, miaka ngapi? Nilikuwa 16. Okay. Nikatolewa hukumu ya, ya utoto. Nikapelekwa Boston. Nikaenda nikangangana na huko, kangana na huko ripoti ikawa ya nyumbani haiingi kwa sababu inasemekana nikirudi kule wale waliofanyiwa ile kitendo watalipisha kisasi Ninashuk- nilikuwa nikiomba sana yani 
wakati wa bond member ripoti haiingi ripoti haiingi ninashukuru madam america yemba wa faraja na america ngede na madam mwenye tuko naye hapa wote ni wa faraja madam america yemba alisimama akisema atanichukua mm. na aliweza kunitoa hapo mahali siko namjua mr joseph, joseph. Mm. nilikuja nikamjua nairobi walinitoa huko nikakabidhiwa kwa mikono yake mm. na nimekaa na yeye na faraja akanisaidia aya Sante, we have to move on because you when you hear this Jane and you've been in this for many many years um, tell us more about what Faraja is doing to help more individuals more young people like Karisa uh, to avoid having to go to jail and you know their lives literally waste away behind bars mm -hmm. what more are you doing through your foundation uh, Faraja is a non-profit that supports offenders ex-offenders a special interest with youth and children in conflict with the law what we did for Carissa, for example, we call it reintegration or reentry. Mm -hmm. When his term ended at the Boston, the Boston is a youth prison in cost. Because of stigma, he couldn't go back home. Mm -hmm. The report that came from probation was like, this guy, if he comes home, he's dead. Of course. So we intervened because he needs a place to stay. He needs some rent. He needs food. So through other partners like Joseph, we paid his rent. We provided his food because he was, he was doing a course in mechanics at the prison. Uh -huh. So he had the skills. He just needed to have some place to go and actualize these skills. That was in Nairobi. He had to come to Nairobi. So we intervened by paying his rent and providing his food until he was able to finish this course and get a place to attach himself and earn a living. So that avoids the shame, the stigma mm -hmm. that he has to go through at home so since he had already had a skill, we supported that way. Others, we give secondary support to go to secondary school education to finish their schools. Others in the audience, vocational training. Others, business startup support, counseling, mentorship. Because we realize when people are in this situation, a lot of trauma, a lot of stigma from the community because people, you are labeled as a criminal. And many young people are in prison not because they are criminals, but circumstances, right. family situations, issues with, the, you know, with friends, peer pressure, drugs, but they find themselves in these institutions yeah. and they can actually become worse. So somebody has to mentor them, counsel them, understand what is going on. Parenting is a big issue yeah, yeah. because once you are there, sometimes you're forgotten even by your parents. So Faraja comes in as the other parent because that is consolation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That is what the word means. We console, we empower, we listen to you. So basically we are giving people a second chance yeah, in life yeah. because everybody needs a second chance. I always say, even though all of us adults here, we were shielded by families, but if you're left on your own or something happened, definitely prison is for everyone, mm -hmm. but we are lucky that uh, somebody shielded us, shielded us from these situations but Faraja comes in we are helping many young people and even older people yeah. women men across the board because everybody needs help so that's basically what we have intervened, intervened for an amazing work because uh, clearly you're showing families a critical force exactly. in ensuring that many of these young youth don't find themselves yes. uh, behind bars Peter let me come to you just speaking from the legal aspect of things and you know all too well what it was like uh, being in prison and, and working your way out, of course. But you find a lot of young people um, are caught for what we consider offenses that are classified as economically or socially petty. And oftentimes should not even go into a courtroom, but they do. And eventually these kids find themselves behind, j behind bars. What would you say needs to be done to avoid that? And what have you been doing uh, on your part as a paralegal expert? I wouldn't call myself a paralegal expert, uh, Vicky. I'm just uh, a passionate uh, human rights, uh, not even an activist. I just believe in the best for humanity. Mm. Um, first of all, I just need to correct one stigma that we start with. Like, everybody who's been in prison is an ex-offender. 
they're ex inmates and ex offenders mm. and you have to have that dichotomy when you're when you're talking about people within prisons because like Carissa's story as I was listening to Carissa I've yeah. never heard it before but there's something that I really connect with there and uh, that informs what we should do in the criminal justice system that are we having everybody who's being who's being convicted to go to prison are they actually guilty of those crimes and especially the young gays who are going behind bars have they been fully tried and has the trial been above board yeah. uh, um it's unfortunate when i went to prison 18 years ago 20 years ago i think yeah 20 years ago we had we didn't have a justice system to speak mm -hmm. of um, it was rotten, it was broken down, and that's why the former president, Kibaki, decided to have a systematic overhaul of the justice system, followed by the next, the, the first the Ringera uh, um, issue, and then Sherrod Rao came on board, mm -hmm. because we needed to have a new justice system. In the criminal justice system, uh, in the constitution, when we got the 2010, we had to change the whole architecture. We are still working on it. But the good thing that I can say from what I've seen right now is that we have a listening judiciary. We have a, a listening uh, police force. I work with the youth on a daily basis. And in instances where I've seen that there are conflict with the law that would touch with the youth, yeah. I don't go out shouting about it. We don't go shouting about it. We engage with the law enforcement directly. We engage with the prisons directly. They're my mentors. They're my custodians for very many years. And most of the things we are doing might be low-key, mm. but we're looking at the long-term effects on this country and on the lives of the youth. Because under the Children's Act, everything has to be in the best interest of the children. We have the probation officers. Are they adequately funded? This goes back to parliament. In as much as we are saying the children's department is not working, what is the budgetary allocation they're getting? What does a prison get? If you look at the budgetary allocation for the prisons, it's negligible. Mm. They don't have enough money to run the prison's department. So how are they going to take care, adequate care of these right. young people? Faraja comes on board, other NGOs come on board. Is that sufficient? No. Are parents playing their roles? No. The highest rate of inmates going to prison today, the young guys, it's about sexual offenses. That is the key thing. You know, people would want to say these boys are snatching our phones and stuff and stuff. Those things could be there. Mm. But why is the highest incidence of crime now being linked to sexual offenses, phone snatching? You go to Jamuri Shogun, which is just around here in Nairobi, touting. You find a guy who's cleared high school, he can't get a job, he goes to tout, he's right. arrested, taken there. I'm working with girls who've been in conflict with the law. One tells you I was caught as a child prostitute. Not because I want to be a prostitute, because I had no option. If I could go back to school today, yeah. that would change. Mm -hmm. And that's why I thank Madam Jane. I mean, she's been very vocal as Faraja, uh, and we're partnering with her very well, and with the prisons department. The girls who can afford to go back, who want to go back to school, majority of them want to go back to school. Majority of, of, majority of the youth who are in prison mm -hmm. want to go back to school. All I'll say is that the, the people of this country should come together and support them, start their lives afresh. It's not about NGOs being supported by outside forces. Let's have this culture of these are our kids. We need to help them find a footing. Yeah. And then we bring back our country to where it's supposed to be. Let me bring in uh, Joseph and, of course, Nameless as well, because you two are, are working together on this mentorship program. Um, Jane had mentioned something really important, trauma which when you think about it, they've already gone through really tough lives and circumstances that pushes them into circumstances that will put them into jail, which is now a double trauma. Um, when you encounter them and you speak with them, what are their stories? What is behind their pain, for instance, that would lead to this trauma that they experience? Uh, I think, uh, Vic, Victoria, what, what we can say when you realize, um, Jane has mentioned about stigma. Mm. And uh, one of the things when you think uh, about stigma, you look at the emotional pain that is going through that person. This person must have gone through a lot of emotional pain, whether it's within the family setup or within the, 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 the friends that they have been with because of these negligence. And one of the things, the stigma can move from, uh, from individual level. It can take five levels of stigmatization yeah. that bring these uh, emotional heart. Uh, first of all, if this one, this young person is not well developed, and especially from dysfunctional family, so therefore the, they have low self-esteem. 
so that they don't even believe in themselves. Uh, the second level of stigma is that within the family, because once somebody is being uh, termed as an, an offender, everybody wants to learn away from you, even your own ones. Mm. Uh, because of that, they will be told even the family is finger pointed. Mm. Let's come to the issue of the organization of where we talk about, is this person in school? If this person is school, can is it possible for this person to be taken back to school? You can take that into the issue of career because then this person is going to miss the point. Then when we come to the community where most of us follow, even in the church, people they don't want to see you. So the stigma continues up to societal level where Peter has just mentioned even because uh, even the stigma is even in the policy making because also it's biased. Vicky, I can assure you, if today even something happened well, well, uh, right now when we are here, uh, men who are here, they will be the first victim. Mm. And uh, the uh, Miri Haemba can tell you, majority of the, the ratio of men uh, and female in the prison, they are the majority. And most of them is because of uh, issues that happen. And they have been stigmatized even because of the policies and even cultural aspect. So therefore, the pain that they bear these young people is uh, is uh, is very is very big, and we we can really you can really feel yeah. it is from the emotional. They have anxiety. They are stressed, yeah. uh, and even that is what led them, even to some of them, to depression. Yeah. And the other thing, the aspect I would like you also to understand is that they, we have also criminalized some mental disorders. Yes. And yes. you'll find that somebody was just reutering, not because he wanted to Reuter, but he's going through this maybe depression, mm -hmm. and when they meet the officers who are patrolling yeah. the, the, the police, they are being taken, okay. and nobody go to do assessment. Let me bring in Nameless, because Nameless, after a visit to a prison, something changed in your <laughs> mind, and you said, I cannot sit on mm. the sidelines when this is happening. Yeah. What was it, and why did you get involved in this? Okay, well, um, for me, I, I normally do mentorship uh, talking to to young guys yeah. and sometimes visiting prisons, and this particular time last year, I was, I was invited to talk to young men mm. who had been in conflict. And obviously, you know, when you hear about prison, you you just imagine all sorts of things and all sorts of guys. But when I went there to talk to these guys, I found some very you know um, receptive mm. young men, and you know, I was talking about basic life skills. You know, and um, there was this young boy who now uh, Joseph mentioned to me and said um, he's uh, that boy is 12 years old. Yeah. And madam thinking, wow, he's a 12 year old here. And the reason it touched me is because I have a 12 year old daughter. And of course, now before you know, you're just talking to them, you don't know the details of their stories. But uh, this particular time, you know, we, we, we stood aside and uh, I started getting to know about his story. And I was so touched because you begin to realize um, it's just that the guidance that was around him wasn't there. Uh, combined with peer pressure, combined with um, no mentorship, no guidance, he made the wrong choice. Mm. And you realize when he'll be there probably four or five months, when he gets out, he'll still not have that guidance and, and, and probably get to do something else and probably even worse. So that's when, you know, we really started talking with Joseph, who's a psychologist, and, um, and we're like, okay, what, what can we do? For me, I've always had this interest, not always, um, but recently, like the last two years, had interest in emotional intelligence. Yeah. And, um, and I would advise everyone to go and Google emotional intelligence and try and understand it. Because even parents, us as parents, we try our best to bring up our kids. But who's teaching us to be better parents? Where are we learning to have the skills to bring up these uh, kids in a way that they'll make the right decisions? And um, that's when we, we uh, decided to you know, talk to Faraja and say, okay, fine, as much as uh, you support them in terms of school, um, how more can we um, guide them? Because obviously the backgrounds that they have, they're not getting enough guidance. Yeah, yeah. And that's where all this mentorship uh, program started. And um, just so that um, they just learn to make the right decisions, the right choices. Yeah, because they are, 
they're always there because of wrong decisions. And as you can see the news today, we are seeing so many killings, so many different things from young people who are, you know, probably they don't know how to deal with the rejection, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. So that's that's where it all started. Yeah. Wow. And of course, we'll get back to you just to get even your take on the burden that's being born by the boy child when yep. it comes to the prison system yeah. and you're just saying it outstrips that of, of females behind bars and we'll be talking <laughs> about why um but a lot of feedback coming in i'm seeing one here on twitter uh vera saying my god the story of this young man uh carissa there broke my heart that his life was wasted in prison i'm seeing my little brother in him and the same thing when you saw that 12 year old boy behind bars i'd like to hear from one of the other beneficiaries uh just to tell us about his experience nick james um what what actually got you arrested and how did you what was your experience like behind bars oh right here sorry yeah <clears throat> okay uh experience the best teacher first of all uh i want to thank all the faraja foundation members um our madam ceo Nameless, our uh, biggest brother, even Mr. Joseph here. So uh, my name is Nicky James from Misiolo, Pale Uh For me, uh, <coughs> if it is a long, it is a been a long story when I was born uh, from a poor background. Mm -hmm. Yani, my mom died when I was six years old, and uh, I've never known even who is my father. So Miss Jibabangu. Adi hakuna mtu anaweza niambia ati babangu alikuwa anakaa hivi na hivi. So I uh, miss him joy. So but it happened that uh, me nilikuwa nasoma but nilikuwa napitia shida mingi sana. So nilienda nikamaliza primary then nikaenda nikaingia secondary. So nikiwa form 2 something happened to me. Sikuwa na ile kitu kujib. Yaani sikuwa na na, na mtu akunipovidea. So I had to take something. Yaani nilikuwa najaribu ni the balance masomo na maisha mm -hmm. so in kona kuna jani ende kwa masomo alafu bado hapa tumbo ni empty so i had to decide one kasema eri niende tu mimi nifanye kazi niache na kusoma so mimi nilitoka nikaenda nakumbuka asubuhi nikaenda kwa rafiki yangu nikamkosa so nikakutamea nika nguo pale uh, jezi ya football so mimi ndio nilikuwa napenda ball na sikuwa na nguo nyingine so nilikuwa napiga na nguo moja wiki mzima mm -hmm juu sikuwa na nguo mahali so nikachukua nikavaa then i went alafu mi jioni vile nilitokea tu kwa mtaa nikasikia nimeshikwa nikaambiwa we niki ulikuja ukaiba hizi manguo kwetu so me had no option kasema siku hii baba nilichukua so and uh, about this concept ni kuhusu mimi nilichukua sikuenda kuuza nilichukua nikavaa and when they caught me nilikuwa nimevaa so wakanipeleka polisi nika, nakumbuka nikapelekwa kotini nikaambua Nicky James uliripotiwa umeiba kitu mimi nikasema si kuiba nilichukua so ikaapen kuomba nikakataa nikatumwa remand 14 days so nikiwa pale kuna mtu alinchano akaniambia wewe ni kijana mdogo you can go back to school after umefungwa so mimi nikapiga hesabu nikaangalia nyumbani hakuna mtu mwingine anaweza nisaidia so venye nilirudi kotini nikakubali kesi Jaji akasema jumekubali kesi and uh, ini kesi kidogo tu julichukua kavai ni, ni stealing. So tumekuachilia. But I, st I stood up na nikainua mkono na kasema jaji mista kuniachilie. <laughs> Nataka unifunge niende shule ya watoto. Kuzi mina juwa ni kirudi nyumbani stasoma. Mm. So jaji akashanga huyu ni aji mtu tunachilia lakini anajifunga bado. So mimi akaniambia sawa tulia hapo. So wakaenda kuongea na, na probation. Then akakuja akaniambia ni Ki James tumerul kwamba utafungwa. Ali alisema mwaka nilisikia kama ni mwaka nne lakini ilikuwa ni mwezi nne. Okay. So mimi akili yangu ilipiga form 1, form 2 na form 3 na form 4 four years. So vile nilienda nikasikia mafungo kamiti nikaenda nilikuwa nimefurahia naenda shule. But vile nilifika pale nikakuta kuna askari kuna bunduki alafu kitu wa kwanza ni wewe unakaba so you have to unajaribu kunyenyekea pale so according to that situation mimi nikakaa pale nikakuwa tu mjela jela nini so but I think god because uh, nilikakaa a few months two months i think mm. ilikuwa ni 2014 mwezi then i met mr joseph and he explained for me about uh, 
and in Faraja Foundation about the Kafaso Constellation, mm -hmm. which is our half home, which I, I grew up from that area. So I can introduce Pale, and I thank God because I mean Litoka Mwezua Kumi na Moja 2014, and I went to Kafaso. So according to me, Faraja has helped me so much. And I really thank them because they have supported me. Because me na kumbuka li shule, 2014, mm -hmm. uh, 2015, I went back to form 2, 2016, form 3, 2017, kamaliza form 4. And also after that, oka niendeleza na masomo, I went and studied International Computer Driving wow. License, ICDL. So pale, bado pia ni kawangeza, ni kasoma driving school. Then uh, after that, Nikashkuru sana, and I went home. So in ho at home in Isiolo, me sina kazi pale. Nilikuwa nafanya fanya kazi na boda boda cause iyo iyo tundo ineza ni pia job. Cause nilienda kuwa play kazi in Kambuwa ngoja ntaitua. Apart from that, I had that I have some talent. Me ni msani, I have seven songs. And then uh, na pia Mr. Nameless, Akonayo. And they <laughs> you can told, connect after this. <laughs> yeah, uh... And I thank God that Mr. Nameless told me that uh, we'll talk more about this music industry. Na I was happy even Mr. Joseph had my songs as a ringtone. <laughs> Supporting so, the youth, Joseph, I like that. <laughs> yeah, so I have a song Masaba, but it's an audio recording, not a video. So, but I uh, thank you very soon. I will have my own videos. Okay. Yeah. So, so we'll be waiting for those ones. Thank you, <laughs> thank James. You, thank you. Um, let me bring you again one, once more, Jane, because we're hearing some good stories. You know, they end well. But many times, in majority of the stories, is they don't. Yep. Um, what are some of the experiences of, of many of the young people who do not get the help from Faraja, yeah. who are not put out on bond mm. and are languishing mm. behind cells right now? What's the situation for them? Unfortunately, there's a lot of need. Some of these guys, if they were not assisted by Faraj and others, you'll find them in committee maximum. Because I have found a few. I met them in the youth prison, and because we couldn't help all of them, others graduated into now adults. That is a crisis situation happening in this country. You have heard from uh, and James, it was a family issue. Mm -hmm. You have no family. So this is in across the board. This is in, we have about three boys institutions in this country that is under prison. We have many under children's department. We have a few under probation. Most of them are for boys. There's only one, a few for girls, about three. So all these kids, all these children, because they are basically children, yeah. they all need help. Faraja is one among many that are doing this, but support is needed. Nick James, for example, when you discussed earlier, he went back home, there is no job. Now he's come back to Faraja again, what can we do? Mm. In fact, just became, before we came in, we were wondering, can we buy a Buddha Buddha? Can we get a loan from somebody? Then he can be paying monthly because we don't help him and he has no support. He told me at the moment even his house was locked because he, he has not paid rent for a month. That still comes back to us. Mm. And it's sometimes very overwhelming. So we're asking for support. Like somebody had mentioned, Peter, I think, Kenyans. These are our children, our brothers. Mm. We're talking about the boy child being criminals but you can hear the stories they found themselves in these situations so my appeal is can we just come in and help because there's a crisis and we know that crisis in this country there's so much i can't even sometimes sleepless nights yeah. because my work first of all in faraja is looking for funds fundraising is like i'm even glad that nameless is joining us because maybe we can use his networks and his contacts yeah. to get support because it costs to yeah. bring to do all these things we do Prisons and probation, which are government departments, of course, we have to assist them. We are partnering with them because of funding and all these issues. So, yeah, there's a lot of issues, especially the boy child. It's really a crisis. And, crisis. Mary, what would you say is a challenge when it comes to trying to manage the prison's population? Um, of course, they are so overcrowded. Um, what is being done to maybe lessen the amount of young people coming in, maybe putting them in alternative programs so you don't have to host them behind bars, for instance? Okay. We have had uh, some discussions with the judiciary whereby we are insisting that uh, petty offenders should actually have go serve their terms outside the institutions. Mm -hmm. So that has been there and it's in progress. And is, we have the, CEO, the C, C, CSO 
program which goes around actually just to make sure that they reduce the pr prison population. Otherwise, the prison population is overwhelmed yeah. and unfortunately by petty <coughs> offenders, which to us is not very fair. Because if we, the, the courts worked very well. And remember, even the major population are remandis, the people waiting mm. conviction. Yeah. So we believe that if the courts did their work right and worked so fast, our prison population would be manageable and would be able to do our programs as expected so that we impact the, the, the right skills to our people. And then when they go out, they get accepted and they have skills and they change behavior and all these things done to them. So largely we say this need for diversion, mm. then even the police, maybe they should take up this issue of diversion. Not everybody should be taken to court. There should be a way of making sure the, 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 the people who go to court, the, to come to a prison, are the really people who have really committed these major offenses. Yeah. But not people who are just can be sorted out even at the police station. Because like in some of these things, call the, the, the offender, call the victim, sort it out there, and then let them go out. And then uh, the, the same, the judiciary should yeah. even make haste and make their, their judgment faster than making people just 14 days, 14 days, 14 days. That's what Oku was talking about. Uh, no, precisely they like keep people 14 days, go 14 days, the file is not found, the file is not there, and people really get hurt. Frustrates the process and yes, someone's life is, you know, yeah, yeah. moving on and they can't yeah, I, I progress. Sorry so for I that. think the criminal justice system is being clogged down mm. by cases that shouldn't be there in the first place. Mm. But on the bigger plane, what I'm seeing down there is that uh, the community service order, for example, that is headed by uh, the Community Service um, Order Act, that's already there, and the committee is headed by Justice Kimaru. Yeah. When they were funded properly, they were getting these petty offenders out of prison very fast. But then Parliament reduces that budgetary allocation every other time. The second thing we need to look at is not just about the law enforcement, the judiciary, and let me play the devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. What's the role of parents in all this? Where's the parent today? Right. Well, is, is the parent spending time with their children the way we used to, the way the old parents used to? What kind of models do we have in the society? If the youth are looking at you as a model and what you're showing them is theft, 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 yeah and they follow that theft, 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 why should we condemn them? When you are carrying the brand, when you are carrying the burden of it. So I think it has to start somewhere. We have to be proper role models in society. If you are going to say we don't want our kids to do X, let's ensure we are not doing that X. Let's start from the very top, from our own families yeah. and say, we say crime is poor, crime is not cool. This is something we started on death row. And we were allowed by the prisons department because we saw the youth were coming in, we didn't feel, we didn't want them to be in there. Yeah. Today I was in Kamae, which is the only girls' Boston institution. We went there with my church where I had the social justice department as well. What happens is there's this girl who had come back to the officer in charge's home, just like he had come back to Jen's place. She had been released, she had been taken to school, and then the parent rejected her, mm -hmm. and she didn't have school fees. Luckily, one of the church members we went with offered immediately, and she didn't know there was someone in need of that school fees, that she's going to take one child to school. Now, the goodwill that Kenyans have in assisting each other should also not be abused. If we have good stewards yeah. who are going to assist and ensure that these kids are properly mentored, what Joseph and Nameless are doing, they're, they're being brought into that, they're being nurtured into those responsible citizens. Right. The law enforcement, I can tell you this for free, I had my own reservations about the law enforcement back then. But right now I'll tell you, wherever we are working right now, we, we put them at the forefront because we bring them to the community, have those community dialogues with the youth, talk with them directly, have, impress upon them the need to, to see that the law, everybody has the right, but also everybody has the obligations to follow. Yeah. So let's inculcate in our culture and in our youth that we need to do the right thing, but we also need to model the right thing. So that it's not just about, and the other thing I'd like to encourage the media, please, these people who are instigating violence, these people who are always insulting people on telly, why do you screen them to us? Because you show them, maybe you get more hits when you show us the politicians hitting at each other, mm. but what impact is it having on these kids? Bullying is going up. As late as Tuesday, I was called to an estate in Nairobi to address an issue of bullying. Kids are bullying each other, that's why they're committing suicide. And yet, who's causing that? What role is the media playing in that as well? So I think as a society, it's not about finger pointing, it's about finding the balance where we are going to ensure that our youth are properly raised, our youth get the right information, they learn, even the boys learn how to respect the ladies, yeah. 
and the ladies also know their space so that there is no unnecessary conflict that leads to crime. Everyone playing their role responsibly. Exactly, exactly. Let's hear from uh, John Njoroge. Uh, tell us about your experience briefly, because time is not on our side, and just how it, it changed you. Thank you very much. My name is John Njoroge. I'm uh, currently I'm a student at Mount Kenya University. Okay, I was born and bred in a very humble family. My parents divorced when I was very young. I think I wasn't even a month old. Yeah, so my mom was to take care of me alone, but she also had to hustle. So I was taken to my grandma, and that's where I grew up. After some time going through primary school, secondary school, in Form 3, yeah, that's when my mom had decided to take me to her house mm -hmm. because my grandma demised that time in Form 3. And by that time, I was not used to staying with my mom. so. I started loitering and moving with the gang. And um, unfortunately, I dropped out of school. I started smoking marijuana, abusing drugs. Yeah, and um, when my mom saw this, she couldn't uphold. Mm -hmm. So she sent me away of, out of her house. I had to depend on myself. I joined a group of two so we became three who also had dropped out of school and uh, we formed a gang. We could steal from people, not necessarily going to rob them. We started by taking things from people's gardens because we were depending on ourselves. So we had to cater for our stomachs first. So that gang became like your family? Yeah. Really? Yeah. We were staying in a rental house where one of the guy's brother used to stay, but he had gone to college. So it came to a time where we saw that we are only having some veggies from the gardens. So it said to uplift ourselves. So it said that we would be stealing from shops where we could get unga, sugar, and fat. Mm. Yeah, and that's how we started upli uplifting ourselves. We stole from a very small shop, food, food stuff, and we kept in our house. So it was only that eating, waking up, because we only stayed at a, at a plot. So it came to a sense that we do not have enough. So we decided to go to a bigger shop where we could steal things that we could sell to get money. And that's what we did. Mm -hmm. We went, and uh, I was so good in opening padlocks by that time. And uh, I was the smallest amongst the gang. So I opened the first padlock, the second, but on the third one, I couldn't. So we, I, it took me around two weeks to make a key for the padlock, but it couldn't. So I, we had to find someone who could break the padlock with a crowbar. And that's when we went for someone who was older than us. By that time I was 16, going oh. to 17. And uh, it came to a time when I was arrested. And obviously I couldn't accept. So I was taken to a juvenile mm -hmm. remand in Muranga. And I was not used to this. We attempted escape on the, uh, after staying for a week and two days. We were beaten up so bad. But it came to my senses that even though, that even though we did wrong in the society, there are still people who can care for us. Mm -hmm. When we attempted escape, we were locked up in a segregation room and we are not giving food. Because they say that we are giving you food, you are getting strength, you are, you are attempting escape. But it came 
one day an officer say that no matter what you have done i may not let you go hungry right so he brought some bread and some milk and that case took me to YCTC committee for four months mm -hmm. and in there i didn't have hope because after all i had lost my chance for education and then i have lost my trust with my people with my family my parents and uh by that time i needed help mm -hmm. and that's when i met joseph joseph used to come there every week to give us counseling and mentorship and he was talking about one halfway home which takes uh, ex offenders when you get a chance and you go back to school and that was my biggest dream and let me cut you short really quickly Njorogate uh, what would you say has changed you after going through that whole experience what has really really impacted you okay the act that the officer did to me is the first thing that touched me to reformation i saw that no matter what i used to do in the community there's still someone who still want to give me a second chance after in yctc another officer i was having two cases and when i was being taken to the court an officer stood up and said that this guy should not be sentenced again he should be released because i'm sure that he has reformed yeah. and out of the judges consent she said that i won't be incarcerated again i was to serve another sentence for three years but the judge said i won't serve again so throughout that experience gave me a, a role i take it as a responsibility to mentor those who have not yet gone to prison because i'm sure that all of us has done mistakes it's just that people have not been caught absolutely and thank you so much for sharing jory sorry sorry to cut you short but i need to come to joseph really quickly because um all of them have talked about this this power of a second chance and and someone seeing the good in them and and not kind of putting an indictment on because you did that one thing this is all you are talk more on that joseph in terms of why that's so important for someone to really rehabilitate and the question is you know after they've gone through jail and that crime do they really change do they really become a new person and how does that happen uh thank you very much there is one uh, one uh, one priest who was a nitarian priest born in 1833 is called saint joseph Cafaso, what they have mentioned and there is this quote that he used to say and that what have been also my drive he used to say that there is no saint without a past and there is no sinner without a future and uh, in this regard for me what is very important uh, victoria here is that for us to recognize the power of the second chance and when do you recognize the power of the second chance is what now nameless is coming about emotional intelligence yeah, yeah. because we are learning in in school we are learning each and every detail and how we are supposed to become good career people and all that but when you look at the component of emotional intelligence that is about self-awareness to understand these guys you must help them to understand their weakness and their strength so that by the fact that they are there they understand this is my weakness this is my strength and then the second component of emotional intelligence is called self-regulation or self-management when this happened to me what do i do as we have been talking about even young people who who we have to train them on how to know that no is also an answer because that has been very difficult that even in our family our children they don't know no is also an answer they understand that component and this is how we help these young people that even lacking is also a way of learning is an experience the second uh, the third uh, component of emotional intelligence is it talks about empathy 
that when they do something wrong to somebody, when they snatch somebody's uh, uh, pass, how if it was them, what would happen to them? If they come and steal you something from you, how would they feel if you have stolen from them? Actually, one of them, one day when we are talking with Nick James, 2014, one of his friends told me, I never used, I asked him, what, did, what brought you here? Uh, he told me, Mimi nilikuwa na cheza, huko raia nilikuwa na cheza na bakumi, uh, Number kumi na moja. Me, I thought is a football number, but you know it's picky pocketing. You know Vicky, when they mm. they put their heart like this, is called number eleven. So now, and he will say that I used to keep good the, uh, when people put their things wrongly. I used to help them to keep well. So you need to also to do cognitive development for them so that they change that attitude that it's better to do this the other part of uh, that is motivation and that's where nameless is coming uh, we have carissa and nikki james who are musician they are upcoming musician they need somebody even nameless may not give them money but he is there to mentor them and to give them motivation right. and that one might delay some some problem Absolutely. for them the last one vicky we need to they we have to help them learn and through faraja and other this this mentorship we are doing with nameless and jane is what we call social skills social skills is a very important thing that we need to learn when to say no when to say yes yeah. when when to say thank you when to say sorry these are simple things that we have not learned and more so this should start from our families. Absolutely. Let me finish up with uh, Nameless, give you the last word. Uh, a word you'd give to the boy child today. <laughs> we keep hearing the boy child is under siege, the boy child yeah. is under siege. What do you tell many young men, and I'm sure who look up to you as well? Yeah. What do you tell them? I mean, I think, um, of course, uh, physically, boys are seen to be stronger, and we're always told, you know, be strong, look strong, and, and act strong. Um, and of course, girls seem to be delicate. So a lot has been, a lot of focus has been on the girl child. But uh, you realize with what's happening in society that when you neglect the boy child, there's still going to be a problem, you know. And um, human beings, as human beings, we have soft spots. We all, even men, you, you when you, when you, when ukiwa ukonyuma, you can see a man. A man also can be weak and 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 show his weakness, and that's that's why for us it's so important to bring out the fact that no one is teaching people about emotions and how to deal with emotions, how to deal with all that. We are being taught science, physics, all those things, and um, us as par parents um, and members of society and older people, we need to begin to equip ourselves to learn how to guide the younger people um, and the younger boys, especially right now, you can see most of us here that we are talking about the boys, um, to be able to deal with their emotions and understand that um, it's okay to be weak, it's okay to, to share what you're going through because if you don't share it, it can come out in the wrong way, you know? And um, that's what we want to really preach out there, yeah. um, that we, we need each other. Um, as, as Joseph was saying, understanding um, how to take rejection, understanding that, you know, understanding situations like win-win. Sometimes when you get into a relationship, try and see how you can both win in the relationship. Sometimes you're thinking, oh, I just want to win and you're, you're frustrating someone else. It will not work, you know? So th things like that are the things that we are really trying to encourage the society. We are a village. We say we're all raising each other up, up, up here. You know, some, some people may not have um, a father or a mother. Someone needs to step in there, you know, and mentor and guide, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, the boy child, we, 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 I'd like to say, you know, to the boy child, um, let's, let's be in touch with our emotions, let's be in touch with um, learning how to relate with each other, um, and let's, everyone else, let's begin to think about the boy child as well. Um, we've, I think we've been neglected for, they've been neglected for too long, and, um, and, uh, and the society will grow, will grow as one. Yeah, Absolutely. that's what I would say. Thank you so much to my panelists. I'm so sorry I couldn't give more time to my extended panel, but it's certainly a conversation that needs to continue beyond uh, this studio and beyond what you're seeing on your screens. Thank you so much for watching and to, of course, the crew that you don't see behind the scenes who've worked so hard to put this out to you. Thank you once again. Have a wonderful evening. Keep the conversation going on social media, in your homes, in your communities as well, uh, so we can see...
fewer and fewer young people behind bars and out being productive and building society. I'll see you again tomorrow evening. Good night.